Listen and understand. There are always consequences. Jordy, you know, one of these days, the, the chickens are going to come home to roost. Consequences. Hello! My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Consequences. Chickens are going to come home to roost. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. Chickens are gonna come home to roost. And it absolutely will not stop. Consequences. Ever. There are always consequences. Stop saying that. Goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life. We have got a five-week series, and it's all about consequences. They can't be argued with, they can't be reasoned with, they will absolutely never stop ever until they deliver to us the things that our actions determine, that what we do now has an impact. And what we said last week was the kind of the basic point is this, what we want for our lives in the future is connected to how we live our lives right now. We know that this happens, we know it happens in the field of uh, exercise. If you exercise now, then you will have good physical health in the future. If you're an athlete, if you train now, then you have a good chance of winning in the future. If you eat well now, you have a good chance of being healthy, fit, and well in the future. What we want for ourselves, if we want happiness, we want financial security, we want fitness, we want good relationships, all those things in the future, they're connected to the way that we live right now. The problem is that many of us, most of us, most of the time, we live like they're disconnected. How we live right now is disconnected to the things that we say that we want. We genuinely want these things, but we don't live in a way right now that helps us move towards that goal. So you say, one day I want to have kids. One day I want these kids to respect me. I want them to grow up feeling good about who I am, that I am respect worthy, that I am worthy of being admired. But you put no effort right now into the character that you're forming, the habits that you're creating, the person that you're becoming. We want these things in the future, but we don't think so much about what are we investing in right now? What sacrifices are we making right now? What things are we doing to take us towards the goal that we want? These things are disconnected. And the reason that they're disconnected so often, they're very easy and understandable reasons. The first one is happiness. We want to be happy now, but happy now does not always translate to happy later. We tend to make decisions not on a rational basis most of the time, but on an emotional basis. Uh, I go out and I drink because it makes me happy. I've got into this relationship because she makes me happy. Maybe there's no long-term future in it, but right now I don't want to be on my own because that would not make me happy. And so happy now becomes the enemy of happy later. And we make choices disconnected from what we want in the future because of our pursuit of happiness. Also because of vision, because we tend to be short-sighted. We only see what's in front of our faces. We see what's happening with our friends. We take our cues from our peers. And because we only see a little bit down the line, we don't see necessarily the thing coming down the road that could actually impact our lives. And then finally, it's a matter of faith. We lack faith that uh, if God asks us to do something, that he can deliver on this. If we exercise restraint, if we deny ourselves, if we take the hard path, the narrow way, we don't have the faith that that's necessarily going to lead to the outcome that we want. We put our faith in luck, that somehow it will just all work out. Somehow we'll be the ones that, even though we're not necessarily investing in the right way, somehow it will all come good in the future. By sheer force of will, I can... I can want it enough, I can desire it enough, I can really intend good things for myself and somehow that will make it work. But there's a disconnect. The Bible calls this the principle of sowing and reaping. And When Paul wrote to um, the church of Galatia, which is modern day Turkey, he said, do not be deceived. A man, God cannot be mocked, a man reaps what he sows. In other words, all those things, happiness, vision, faith, don't be deceived because those things, they, uh, they can be deceptive. Happiness, what the heart wants, it can not always give to you the thing that you're looking for. But the principle is this, you reap what you sow. And he says this, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. 
Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. In other words, the principle of sowing and reaping is a neutral one. There's good things that can happen when you sow well. And there's negative, destructive things that can happen when you sow negatively. So we want to look at some of those in detail. And if you missed last week, then go back and look over that session because it really lays the groundwork, the foundation for what we're talking about. But Paul says it's possible to sow to please the flesh. What does that mean? Well, it means your base appetite. It means the basic part of you. Sometimes it's what the heart wants. Sometimes it's the thing that will make me happy now. It's the the part of me that has an appetite for something which is not necessarily in my best interest. You sow to what comes naturally, as opposed to sowing to what pleases God, which he allows us to have a uh, a good reward that we reap. And what I want to look at is just the first thing um, in those sowing to please the flesh. When Paul's talking to the Galatians, he expands on this a little bit. He talks about what the acts of the flesh are. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. And then he goes on, impurity, debauchery. These things are obvious. Paul says if you want to know what things are destructive to sow into your life, it's obvious. And the first one is sexual immorality. Now, this is kind of awkward, because if you're here and you're brand new, this is your first time, particularly if you're not used to church, this may make you feel a little bit the desire to squirm. Because when Christians talk about sexual immorality, it can seem so puritanical, it can seem so finger-wagging, and it can seem, frankly, irrelevant to modern life. You know, you think, well, I'm an adult, I'm able to make my own good choices, I don't buy in for that stuff, or that way in which the Bible is just... It's just so uh, restricted and it's outmoded and all these things. Now, if you know Christians and if you've been around church, then you'll know that when the Bible talks about sexual immorality, it means the um, sex outside of marriage. So that word sexual immorality in the Greek, it is the word porneia. So porneia in the Greek, everyone say porneia. That's where we get our English word pornography. It just means... Uh, Sexual activity outside the context of marriage, it could refer to adultery, it could refer to premarital sex, it could refer to uh, a whole host of different things, prostitution, the Bible kind of lumps these things all together and it says these things are immoral, They're, they're sexually improper and they will actually be destructive when you think that they're going to be constructive and good for you, you think that they come naturally, actually you need to think it through and have a little bit of wisdom. So what we're going to talk about in this uh, next few moments is just the whole issue of sex. What does the Bible say? Is the Bible anti-sex? Is it against sex? Is it somehow so bound up with telling people not to do it that uh, it's just hopelessly out of touch? What's going on? And what I want to do is I want to talk you through one of my favorite books in the whole Bible. And that book is a book, The Song of songs. Put your hands up if you've heard of Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Okay, great. About half of you. Song of Songs was a, a poem. It's 3,000 years old. It was incorporated into the Old Testament, the Jewish ancient scriptures. And it was written, attributed to King Solomon, supposedly the wisest man who ever lived. And it's a book entirely about sex. And for some of you, when we talk about a book about sex in the Bible, you would imagine that this would be a book that would tell you, don't do it. It's dirty. It's wrong. It's nasty. You'd imagine that the Bible would double down on that stuff. But actually, the book of Song of Songs is incredibly erotic, free, and joyful about sex. In fact, it paints such a great picture of sex. Instead of telling you what you should not be doing, it says, this is a future that you would like to have. This is a future that you could look forward to. This is a future that is worth making some good choices about, making some sacrifices about, having a a different idea about how you live today, because this is a great future. The thing about the the book, Song of Songs, this erotic love poem, is that it talks about sex. But unlike your karma sutras or the other stuff with the positions and all that jazz, sex within the Bible is put into a context. It's put into the context of relationships. Because 
We know this. Sex, if it's going to be any good at all, it's dependent on the relationship. If you've got a good relationship, if you've got a good connection, you get good sex. Bad relationship, bad connection, bad sex. Relationship goes bad. The first thing that drops out, sex. Sex outside of the relationship is not really worth talking about. Sex within a relationship, that's where it really gets good. And uh, so it talks not just about these couple in the poem that have a great sex life, but it talks about the love that they have. And it keys into something very powerful in us because every single one of us, whether you're married, single, used to be married, want to be married, hope to be married, desperate to be married, every single one of us wants to know that love. We want to know that there's someone there that is crazy about us, that is passionate about us. And the Bible gives us this thing. And this gets quoted at weddings all the time. Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse uh, 6 and 7, it says, Place me like a seal over your heart. When it says seal, that's not a... It's a, it's a commitment. It's, it's romantic, okay? That's just a weird, weird image. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. It's passion, unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. In other words, this is a heady, joyful, ecstatic, exuberant expression of what love is about. It's passionate. It's fiery. It's flames. It's more precious than anything that you could ever buy, pay for, try to get. It doesn't matter if you're the richest man in the world. You have nothing on this. Love between two people. It's so awesome. So amazing. So like I said, this gets used in, in the weddings all the time. you just got to be a little bit careful with it. Because Song of Songs, if you get it wrong, it, it, you know, some of the other stuff is a little bit more f- what is fruity. <laughs> so I was at a wedding uh, a few years ago when they were supposed to read this passage, Song of Songs 8, verse 7. But they read Song of Songs 7, verse 7, which says this. Your stature is like that of the palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. So you've got to be careful. Because, and this is the Bible, kids. You need to read the Bible. Lots of fruit-based analogies in Song of Songs. And don't even get me started with the pomegranates because that's just, that's like a whole nother level. But it has this thing. But what you find in it, as it talks about intimacy in a relationship, It gives you this kind of formula. It follows. Intimacy follows exclusivity. Intimacy follows exclusivity. And you have these two, this couple, this passionate pairing. There's the lover and there's the beloved. There's he and there's she. And it is this riotous, wonderful, incredibly passionate expression of this love. They belong to one another. They are exclusive to one another. Intimacy follows exclusivity. Intimacy comes when there's one person who loves you more than anybody else in the world. And they're not your mum and they're not your dad. And they're not related to you by blood. They don't have to love you. They're not biologically wired to love you. But somehow, someone that you are fixed on is also fixed on you. You belong to them. No one else is more important to them than you. Exclusivity breeds intimacy. It's only when we're part of a crowd that we're just one of the number in a black book that we lose intimacy and we don't feel that close to someone when we're just one of a few. But when there is the one, even today, in public consciousness, in our culture, we yearn, we long for that dream, that vision of Being the one, having the one, knowing someone who above all others, forsaking all others is fixed on you. Intimacy follows from exclusivity. The more exclusive and special the relationship, where it's just you against the whole world, the more intimate that it feels. Intimacy follows exclusivity, but exclusivity follows commitment. 
You have to commit to someone in order to have an exclusive relationship with them. And so that's what Song of Songs goes through. And my recommendation to you is this. Go back and read the Song of Songs. Read the book, Song of Songs. It's just before Isaiah, if you know those things. Or you just Google it, you get it on the the Bible app. But here's a little bit of a rundown of how the book is structured. Because it is a poem and it needs to be understood as to what it's trying to say. So basically, chapters 1 and 2 are about the courtship of this couple. It says this, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. When I was a kid in the 80s, they used to play this song in the clubs all the time. Kiss me with your mouth. Anyone know that song? Your love is better than wine, but wine is all. Anyway, it was a, everyone would be pumping on the dance floor because the, um, the kind of the house movement grabbed onto Song of Songs. It's so romantic. Kiss, and this is not a kiss on the lips. It's not a peck on the cheek. It's a full mouth. And he says, your love is more delightful than wine. Wine becomes a motif through the whole song. And it talks about that intimacy, but it flows from exclusivity. She says, uh, my beloved is mine and I am his. There's an exclusive nature to our relationship. My beloved is mine and I am his. Not just I am one of his or I am a few of his. I am his and he is mine. And then it goes on to this idea of commitment. She says to her unmarried friends, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. In this courtship phase, and we just met one another, and we're heady, and we're in love, and we're falling in love, and I can't believe it, and I'm thinking about him all the time, and my heart goes, bada bing, bada boom, every time he walks into the room. See, I'm just making poetry here. She says, oh, this stuff is so good. And if you don't have this, it's worth waiting for. It's worth sacrificing for. It's worth making hard choices over. Because you don't want to screw this up. You don't want to mess this up. If this is the happiness that you want in the future, act now. Don't arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Chapter 3 is the wedding day. And so you see within this wedding day, King Solomon wearing his crown. I don't know whether it's literally King Solomon or whether she just says, hey, you're like King Solomon to me. And they role play. But it's the day his heart rejoiced. And on that day, again, she says to her unmarried friends, she says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't arouse or awaken love until it so does us. I'm on my wedding day now, and I can tell you, it's worth waiting. It's worth saving yourself for, because it is so good. If you didn't think it was good, you'd just do whatever you wanted. But if you could imagine that this is more precious than all the gold in the world, then you would not arouse, not awaken, not pre, um, preempt that special thing that is yours in the future. Chapter 4. Wedding night. So the Bible actually pulls back the curtain. It gets very kind of fruity, let's say. And you have this incredible thing where the poetry just describes them as they see one another naked and unashamed. And then frankly evaluating each other's bodies and uh, praising them and being just incredibly awed. And then he says to her, you are a garden locked up. My sister... My bride, don't freak out about the my sister bit. This is an expression in their culture. Sister was a way of saying, it's an affectionate term. doesn't mean that she was literally a sister because that would be wrong and uh, we wouldn't talk about that. But he says, you're a garden, but you're a garden that's locked up. In other words, there's a purity. You're a virginal bride. You're beautiful, but you've also remained uh, full of integrity. You've kept holy, and that is amazing. You're a God. And you think at this point that it's the guy that's evaluating the woman. It's the guy that's saying, oh, I'm so glad that you're pure. I'm so glad that you saved yourself. And then the woman just lays it. No, Song of Songs is nothing if it's not a passionate expression of female sexuality. Incredibly sex positive. And she says, arise, north wind, come blow on my garden. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice <laughs> fruits. It carries, oh, you've got to read this stuff, you've got to read this stuff. And then there's a kind of uh, exhaust and they're both smoking in bed. And he says, I have come into my garden 
my sister, but not in the weird way, my bride. I have drunk my wine and my milk. There's the wine analogy again. I've, I've been drinking the wine. The wine was good. Yeah, I came into my garden. And then the weirdest thing happens. Another voice comes into the equation. And it's almost like the way that the Song of Songs is structured. It's like God speaks. And he doesn't say, that's disgusting. He says this, eat friends and drink. Drink your fill of love. Which can sound a little bit kind of creepy. <laughs> you know, God's watching as you go into the garden. Uh, carry on gardening, my friends. But it's like God says, I want you to enjoy this. I created this. I could have made it painful. I could have made it painful to have sex and do reproduction. But you did it just because of, you know, taking one for the team. No, I've made it so that this is an expression. Sex is an expression of the relationship. You divorce sex from the relationship, you get bad sex. You just get aerobics. But you put sex within the context of relationships. And you've got something that God gets fully behind and says, I want you to enjoy this. I want you to drink the wine. But, you know, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with a kind of courtship, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, and then they get married, ah, that's wonderful, uh, and then they have the wedding night and the honeymoon, oh, that's great, and they all live happily ever after. It doesn't stop there. It would be great if it did, but it doesn't. It gets even better, because it goes, chapters 5 and 6, into the deepening marriage. And as they go through their marriage, actually they experience difficulty. They experience uh, tension. They experience misunderstandings. And there's miscommunication and there's, there's a bit of hurt and there's a bit of distance that comes into their relationship. And there's one point where he's trying to make a connection with her and she's kind of cold shouldering him, ghosting him. And then she regrets it and then she runs out and it's all going bad. And she says, I called to him, but he did not answer. And they have this difficulty in their relationship. They have a difficulty in the marriage. But they're able to work it through. And in chapter 6, she says this. I am my beloved's. And my beloved is mine. Exclusivity. Exclusivity. When she said at the beginning, she said, my beloved is mine and I am his. But now she says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. There's an exclusivity. There's a passion. There's a commitment between them. And then chapter 7, you get off the back of that a deepening sexuality. So you get another sex scene. More gardening, more fruit-based analogies. Um, More breasts. Uh, He says, may your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine. Which is a great word. Just um, You can use that line. The fragrance of your breath like apples. And then he says this. And your mouth like the best wine. In other words, this is, and you've got to see this because it's so, so powerful. They use wine as a metaphor. Wine is the analogy of their sexual relationship, their their kind of intimate communion with one another. It's wine. It it flows. and, And God says, drink the wine. But now they've been married, and you kind of take from the text that maybe there's been a few years. Maybe there's been a a passage of time. It's it's a long-term thing. Anyone can be sexually passionate in the early days. But the Christian biblical model of marriage is one that goes through the difficult times, one that is kept in through commitment, and then comes into better and more fulfilling, more wonderful sexual experience. And so he says, it's not just wine. It's not just wine. It's the best. Wine. There's a kind of narrative that goes around in culture these days that says that old married couples have either bad sex, no sex, or boring sex. The Bible says if that happens, you're definitely doing it wrong. You're doing the relationship wrong, you're doing the marriage wrong, but maybe you sowed wrong. Maybe there's destructive things that are now coming to light. But if you do this well, the marriage, actually the sex within the marriage is supposed to get better. The wine is supposed to mature. It becomes vintage. It becomes good. And so not only do I get a passionate thing about courtship, which has its boundaries, and yet is still very passionate. Not only do I get the wedding and all the beautiful things of that, I get the honeymoon, the wedding night, but I get the problems in the marriage. But commitment takes you through to intimacy because commitment breeds that exclusivity, which makes that intimacy. And so now their sex life is better than ever. And they end up chapter eight with the secret of their success. 
Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. In other words, I want you to be mine in your heart. And I want you to be mine in your body. I want you to be mine with your character, your personality, your psyche. And I want you to be mine with your body, your sexuality, your physicality. I want both of those things to be locked into me, kept into me, sealed into me. And then she says, for the last time, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. And then she gives the secret of what you need to do now to get that in the future. And the whole book is kind of structured in a way that says, this is a future. This is a desirable future. This is an incredible future. What do you need to do? What's the secret to that success? If you're telling me, don't arouse or awaken love, well, what do I need to do? What can I do right now that will give me this outcome? And in the moment, I'm going to come and I'm going to reveal to you what that secret is. But I want to just take a little step back because that's kind of the rose-tinted version. It is intimacy follows exclusivity follows commitment. And that is the kind of thing that uh, Song of Songs is all about. But I just want to take a couple moments to be real about where we are because you're thinking to me right now and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's great, Philip. It's nice that the Bible's got this kind of fruity poem. But I don't live in that world. I don't live in that reality. That's not my experience. And that's not what people around me are doing. And it's absolutely true. So let's talk about that for a minute. Instead of intimacy, we go for immediacy. The culture that we live in, when it comes to sex, it's not so much intimacy, which is the thing that we prize and we treasure and we look forward to. It's immediacy. I want it and I want it now. And the way that our culture is going, it's very much about apps and you know, Tinder and Grindr and all these things where you can have instant connection, instant, immediate sexual gratification. It's now kind of assumed with the hookup culture that we've got and the kind of sexual landscape that we live in that if you get into a relationship with someone and if you like them, then sex should be immediate. But that's short-sighted. It's actually not the smart play. Like I said last week, we tend to make our decisions based on what we can see. And we can only see around us. We can only see in front of us. We can only see what our friends are doing. We don't necessarily see 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. But the people that do see that stuff, psychologists, sociologists, what they do is we call them longitudinal studies. When they study relationships and they study sexual practice over 5 years, 10 years, 15 years. And when you look at what they say, it's a very different picture. For example, there was a report published in The Independent just a couple of years ago. And it talks about findings of a recent survey done over many years that found out that couples that delayed sex from their relationship, the longer that they delayed it, the better that the sex was when it came. So couples that slept together within the first six months of the relationship ended up reporting lower levels of satisfaction, not only in the sex, but in the relationship. Whereas couples that waited until they had six months, 12 months, a longer period of time, always reported better sexual experience. Because immediacy isn't going to get you what you think you want. It's not going to get you intimacy. It's going to get you something which will actually work against intimacy. Because when sex immediately comes into a relationship, it sucks all the energy out of the relationship. It dominates the relationship. And you don't get the chance to build the relationship that you need because sex just takes over. And as a result, the relationship suffers. And as a result, the sex suffers. And the relationship does not always thrive. Immediacy. Instead of exclusivity, we look for experience. People will say the most important thing about sex, you get experience. You may have even thought to yourself, or you've heard people say things like this, you know, I want to be sexually experienced. Obviously, I want to have the one in the future, but when I get to them, I want to be able to perform. I want to be able to climb the palm tree and know what I'm doing with the grapes. I want to be able to, uh, you know, do my little gardening so that I've got it all sorted out. I don't want to go into a relationship where I don't have experience. Well, that's just, that's just naive. It's, it's just wrong-headed. It, it betrays a complete lack of understanding of what sex is. I, when people say this to me, I sometimes feel like saying, seriously, do you, do you not even know what sex is? It's more than just mechanics. That's the, that's the basest part of it. It's all about relationship. 
You know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, if you find someone, if you love them, then you should, you know, try it out sexually just to make sure that you're compatible. What? You, seriously, do you understand the sex? You are compatible if you have a loving relationship. Okay, it's not Meccano. These things work emotionally, relationally. When you love somebody, when you commit yourself to them, when you have that exclusivity, then the relationship will take care of the sex. It may take time. It may take space. It may take... But that's what we do with committed relationships. We build a container for the love. We build a container for the relationship. We build a container for the sex life. Most people, their sex life as a couple gets better after time. You talk to my wife. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. You talk to my wife. She'll tell you that perhaps it took 10 years for it to get really good. She'll tell you. She'll tell you it's none of your business. All I'm saying is we have the best wine. But we have this thing. And so in our culture, cohabitation is now a big deal. Living together is now a big deal. 20-year-olds today... Half of you will never get married. Half of 20-year-olds today in the UK will never get married. Why? Because cohabitation is now the thing. People more likely cohabit. And why do they cohabit? Experience it. When I said to Kate, her father, when I I just uh, proposed marriage, uh, we went to her father, and he said to me, can't you just live together? I'm like, no. One, I'm a minister. Two, I'm not naive. I know that experience is no substitute for exclusivity. And actually, the cohabitation illusion, and again, the studies, the research bears this out time and time again. Cohabiting relationships are not secure. A couple that cohabit, that live together, are five times, five times more likely to break up than a couple that marries each other. And so he said, well, live together and then get married. No, no. It doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. Why would you think it would work like that? That That doesn't make sense unless you're six years old. Living together before marriage leads to a greater risk of divorce. Couples that live together before they get married are 60 to 70% more likely to divorce than couples that don't live together before marriage. You say, Philip, that doesn't make sense. Well, it does if you think about it. Because when you live together just for the experience, you're not committing and you're not necessarily exclusive. You're just the next one that is being tried out like a clothes rack in the dressing room. I'll just try this outfit on. Oh, no, I didn't quite like it. Off it goes. It's a whole different ballgame to when people commit themselves because there the love can grow, there the sex can grow. And so over and over again, no matter what study you look at, cohabiting couples report lower levels of satisfaction with their sex lives and they report higher levels of conflict in the relationship. Cohabiting couples with children make up the minority of families in the UK today, about one in five. But they make up a disproportionate amount of the broken families in the UK. And I'm not putting this down, and if you live with someone or if you used to live with someone, I'm not criticising. I'm just telling you the general principle is you sow exclusivity and you get intimacy. You sow experience and you just get some experience. You get some baggage. You don't get something that has the same stickability, strength. And instead of commitment, we have consumerism. Porn. Porn is nothing but the consumerization of sex. It's the commodification of sex. It's when someone says, hey, I'll just get sex over here. I'll click on this and get sex over there. I'll get some sexual immediacy, some sexual release. I'll get some sexual uh, experience It doesn't lead to commitment and it doesn't lead to exclusivity and it just cheapens us. And so we know that the more addicted we get to pornography, the more we experience things like erectile dysfunction, the more men tend to uh, objectify women. It's just not good stuff. And so this is what the Bible says. It says, this is the secret to success. Chapter 8 gives us this. And it's unusual. But it says this, we have a little sister. Her breasts are not yet grown. What shall we do for our sister on the day she's spoken for? Now, you remember when I said about sister being like a term of affection? 
In this case, what you've got is you've got the couple that have grown now so much that they have a daughter, their little sister. She's maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. Her breasts have not yet grown. She's not been through full uh, maturity physically and sexually. But they're saying to her, oh, man, we have such a good relationship. We have such a good sex life. What can we do for our daughter? What can we do for the next generation? What's the best thing that we can give her? And they say this, if she is a wall, we will build towers of silver on her. If she is a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. What's going on? They're basically saying the decisions she makes now impact her future. What she does now is connected to how she lives in the future. The choices that she makes, the habits that she forms, the commitments that she puts herself through, they have an impact. And you've got two different personalities because commitment actually is a key to intimacy. But commitment can start and should start and always does start before the relationship. You start commitment and you build commitment into your life right now. When you're single, when you're hopeful, when you are in a position to not be in a relationship. And they say, look, if she is a wall, in other words, if she keeps herself morally pure, if he keeps himself morally pure, uh, holy and whole, then we will build towers. And this is where it's like God comes along and says, look, you make that commitment. You save yourself. You act like a wall. You put that wall in your heart. You make that commitment to your future happiness right now. I will make you uh, towers of silver. I'll take the wall. I'll take the foundational material of your life and I'll enhance it. I'll increase it. I'll make it more. I'll make you more than you ever were before. Towers of silver so that you become even more attractive, that you become even more wonderful and beautiful and desirable and able to do well in future relationships. If she's a door, and some, some of us, it's like we're revolving doors when it comes to our sexuality. There's no boundedness, no boundaries. And God just says, it's not the end. It's not the end of the world. It's not ideal. It's not the best way to be. But if that's how you have been, if you've been like a door, just letting anybody into your heart, letting anybody into that intimate place, letting anybody into that love that's been aroused and awakened before it should be, then this is what I'll do. I'll build cedar paneling, the most ornate paneling around you so that you regain what it is to be morally pure and to have that kind of layer of commitment laid upon your heart so that you can be everything that you need to be for the person that you want to be with. Ideally, a wall from day one doesn't always happen. I thank God I was able to say to my wife on our wedding day, no one but you. I kept myself for you. In fact, this is kind of embarrassing. I didn't even kiss a girl until I was 26 years old, and it was my wife. But I tell you what, I'm happy with the commitment that I made. But for some of us, maybe you're late in the game to faith. Maybe you've done things and you did it with the best intentions in the world. Maybe you were pressured into something. Or maybe you just took your cues from what everyone else was doing, but you feel like, actually, I'm more like the door. God says, don't worry, I'm not condemning you. I'm not pointing a finger. I want the best for you. I'll panel you with cedar. I'll help you be what you need to be in order to be successful in relationships in the future. But this is what the woman's able to say. I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Not quite sure what the male equivalent is. I am a wall and my... No. Um, but she says, I was a wall, and I'm still a wall. And my breasts are like towers. In other words, she says, I'm fully in touch with my spirituality. I'm a wall, but I'm also fully in touch with my sexuality. I'm a sexual being, and I, I don't feel ashamed of that, and I know that God doesn't shame me for that. But when you combine spirituality and sexuality, thus I have become, in his eyes, like one bringing contentment. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. You want that intimacy? You want that passion? You want that joy? You want to experience the best wine? Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to do the things now that will lead to that in the future? So we're going to pray, but here's an A, B, C for you. How do we get this? First of all, you ask God. Some of you tonight, what you need to do 
And in the next few days, you need to ask God for forgiveness. Because you know that you've crossed lines. You know that you've been more like the door than the wall. Some of you, you need to ask God for grace because you find this so hard. Some of you, you need to ask God for hope because actually you've done everything right. You've done everything right and yet it still hasn't happened for you. And you feel the pain of that. But we ask God, we invest and involve him in our life, in our struggles, in our pain, in our failure. Ask God. Then B, you become accountable. Some of you, you're in relationships and actually you have stepped over the line. And you need to become accountable to one another and say, look, let's row back from that because we want the best for us. And if we're going to give ourselves a really great chance to succeed as a couple, then let's do it right so that we're sowing good things that we will reap in the future. We do not want to be like those couples that have a high sexual experience in the early days and then it all tails off because you didn't put the fundamentals in. Others of you, you need to become accountable to the people in your hub or people that you are in a prayer uh, triplet with or friends that you have, a leader that you look to, but become accountable and say, look, would you hold me? Would you look at my browser history? Would you uh, hold me to account with a relationship, the way that I am treating uh, my boyfriend? Would you hold me to account? And then see, commit yourself to holiness. You commit yourself to holiness. And you say, God, right now, I want to be the wall you build upon me. I want to be integrity. I want to have integrity in my being. I want to be fully spiritual as well as fully sexual. And God will do that for you. We're going to pray. And we're going to give a little bit of time to do that. We want to pray without any, uh, any condemnation, knowing that God is for us. That God looks to us and says, this is my thing. I'm sex positive. But more than that, I'm relationship positive. Positive, and I want you to be intimate, and I want you to have the best wine that there is available. But you sow good things and you reap in the future. So I want you to just close your eyes. And right now, I want you to ask God for the thing that you need to ask Him for. For some of you, it's forgiveness. For some of you, it's grace and help. For some of you, it's wisdom. For some of you, it's just hope. But take a moment of silence to do that.